This is Colonia Cast, episode 17. Make sure to check us out at theturtleroom.org slash ColoniaCast, where you can find more about the program as well as access the Colonia Cast Student Research Fund. Uh, today we're joined by Anuja Maital, who is currently a PhD student at University of Georgia. Uh, prior to this, Anuja did work at AVC University in India. Uh, she's focused a lot of her work on the turtles of, of India and, and the Ganges, or Ganges River uh, and, and some other tributaries and such there. So we're excited to talk about some of that. Um, she's also one of the co-founders of Freshwater Turtle and Tortoises of India on the Indian Biodiversity Portal page, uh, which is an interesting thing if you're in India and, and observing turtles to, to report there, but also just a great source of information on the, the turtles of India as well. Uh, so we're really excited to have you on, Anuja, and to talk to you about some of the work that you've done and, and India's turtles in general. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be you. All right. So um, this is just a, a general question that we start off with every episode, um, just to get our listeners familiarized with you. Uh, what got you into turtles and when did you start your interest in turtles? So I watched a couple of episodes and my answer is completely different than all of the previous people you had on. And it's even different from a lot of people who work in wildlife in my field who have like amazing stories of like being in the wild or growing up near nature, growing up. And no, I did not have any of that. I grew up in a city like Mumbai and was not exposed to any wildlife nature growing up. Like, barely anything and um, I took zoology um, in undergrad and that's what got me interested into birding and meeting other people that would go out on nature trips and that's where it all started but I didn't see or know about turtles in India or see my first turtle till I was off till it was after my undergrad I think I was like 2021 um, I was interning on a frog call project in the Western Ghats, which is like lush, green, tropical rainforest where I didn't have cell network. It was raining like 24-7 the entire month. And um, I was walking through like a grassland that was inundated and there was something that like scuttled ahead of me and I went and caught it and I saw there was a turtle. And I didn't have my phone or anything with me. So I went back to the field station and clicked a few photos and then let it go in a pond nearby. And then we just had one book um, called Reptiles of India in the field station. And I started looking it up and it just had only the, the common species of India in, in it. And I was able to ID it. It was the Indian common, uh, Indian pond, um, black pond turtle, Melanocalis trigiga. And even though it was the most common species in India, like it's found almost everywhere across India and there are like four subspecies, there was absolutely no information on it, like very, very limited information compared to how much we know about other mammals, birds, or even really common snakes. And that was really shocking to me. And then I started looking up more about turtles of India and I was shocked to know that we had like 27, 28 species at that time. And some of them looked so beautiful and so colorful. And I, I thought that all of this only existed in other parts of the world. Like I was genuinely baffled that all of the reptile workshops, herb workshops and herb people I spoke to, none of them ever mentioned turtles and nobody was working on turtles in India. And that was like something that was really shocking to me. So the more I just started researching about it and just I just got so fascinated by them. And then I was like, I have to do like my master's research on this. So that's that's kind of where it all started. And I actually went to docent after that at the Madras Crocodile Bank Trust. I don't know if you've heard about it, but it's an amazing center for herpetology in India. They have like 19 species of uh, crocodiles there. And so when I went to docent there, that was the first time where they had like nine species of turtles and tortoises in captivity, including two of the endemic species of India. And so just being around those turtles and actually getting to see them, handle them and like do husbandry and learn more about them, that was like it for me. I was like, okay, I'm I'm sold. I love turtles. This is what I'm gonna do for the rest of my life. So it's definitely That's a different story than most. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's that's cool. You mentioned so you did your master's. I guess your master's was sort of your kind of gateway into the research world is that mm -hmm. yeah 
so before that i was purely like pretty aimless that's why i'm again so in awe of you guys that y'all are so into the research game already and know what y'all want to do that's like amazing to me i was i was pretty aimless even um after my undergrad i was just interning cuz i just wanted to be in the wild cuz i i think i was deprived of that in my childhood that i was just like i just want to spend all my time outdoors i don't care what i do and um so yeah while i was doing my masters um it was in south india in the state called tamil nadu and so the madras crocodile bank was like 4 hours from there so i applied for like their docent intern program and every weekend i would travel there and spend the weekend there and just you know spend days cleaning up mugger crocodile poop and just like chopping vegetables for all of the tortoises like that's what i did for 2 years and honestly was the best one of the best years of my life i would say looking back so yeah that's cool to have an experience like that kind of early on and then kind of bring it to the, sort of i guess the next level of, of interest there so for your masters yeah um you did some really interesting th- some some interesting work with that looking at i guess the community ecology and then mm-hmm. resource use I've actually I've done some work with the pond turtles like competition and it yeah. it sort of hits home right it's a similar kind of thing but you did this on a, a larger scale within the Ganges maybe you could talk a little bit about uh kind of specifically what questions you analyzed and what you were interested in looking at there Yeah so it was really difficult to try to come up with a good project because firstly i didn't have any guidance there weren't really any mentors there isn't any faculty in india that focuses on turtles or who really does turtle research um so it was kind of like things that i had to figure out all on my own uh it was just stuff that i would read from papers and be like okay try to come up with different hypotheses different questions So um from what i saw was the main stem of the ganges river is huge so like the rivers here like the ganges is pretty big it the the width can be many many kilometers wide and it's just like huge sandbanks and sand islands for like miles and miles um where is the tributaries i looked up a lot of um distribution records of a lot of turtles and a lot of them seem to be concentrated along the sarju river and a, a, another tributary called ghagra river which were in cl- close proximity to each other and they differed really really dif- like they had very very different habitats so like the ghagra river is kind of similar to the ganges where it's um r- got a really fast current and a lot of sandy banks um whereas the sarju river is more like a wetland actually that's a photo of sarju which is kind of like um so even though it's a it's a lentic river it's still pretty it's bigger than most of the streams in the US and uh, just like crazy amount of aquatic vegetation and a uh, very 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 remote so um i saw that there were like different different records of different species from both of these rivers so the first thing i actually was supposed to do was actually a population estimation of the black uh, the spotted pond turtles cuz i was so fascinated by them and um i knew that they were two populations were reported from both of these rivers so the original plan was to trap turtles and do a population mark recapture study however um during my 5 months of sampling i think i caught about 80 to 90 turtles in in both rivers combined um and hardly i think five or six of them were uh, spotted pond turtles and i had like maybe i caught like scores and scores of punctura like the indian ten turtles and the roof turtles and all that entire genus there's three species there and i only got like two recaptures so immediately like the first two months and first three months in fact when i was not recapturing anything that was the time i was like oh no this is my master's research what am i going to do and i didn't have really anyone to guide me on like what to do and how could i change things so i just really focused on you know trying to do learn more natural history about them and try to see what is different about the habitats in the two rivers and why are we seeing different species compositions because i started getting even a couple of species that i honestly didn't even expect to find like the indian eye turtle the morinia species and stuff so it was just baffling to me that uh, even especially in sarju river in just a 10 km stretch i found like eight species that were like coexisting and some of them are like three of them were soft shell species that you would think 
share the same niche but and in this time in this tiny river so it it all kind of stemmed from that and um then i changed changed my research questions around and cooked up something so i looking at your questions i feel like you'll have read my thesis or read some of my publications and i am embarrassed like i look back at my master's thesis and, and my style of writing and it's it's embarrassing so i'm sorry to have put you all through all of that <laughs> No, I I did go through this. I think that some of us have too, but it I mean it I think we all it it's very good. <laughs> it was so it's very detailed and I, I mean I I think it's great it, in terms of the question that you answered there. It's it was like you said sort of gap in the knowledge that exists, yeah. right? And it it's interesting to hear that you plan on doing a mark recapture study, but then it turned into kind of an assessment of yeah. other things. But it was almost kind of more interesting in a way right if you had two years of marker capture data yeah. that's only so useful right but but you actually kind of quantify the diversity yeah. and it, that was pretty interesting but you also looked at you mentioned something about the soft shells right you would think that the three species that mm -hmm. are co-occurring have th th they wouldn't be able to do that right but they have different niches and you also yeah. worked on that a little maybe Specifically for the soft shells, you can talk about like what was different about the habitat they were using and maybe some of the mm -hmm. other species like you, you actually looked at sort of resource partitioning, right? Yeah. How, so how did you go about that and what mm -hmm. did you find, right? So initially when I soon started to, like I started sampling in the really winter months because like it, we only get to do our entire field work in the final semester of our master's, which is a fucked up way of doing sorry I don't know if I can abuse but anyway um so I started like in December and it was really cold and I was hardly getting a few to like three four turtles a week which was not what I expected and again I think I'm like the only person in India who is actively like trapped for turtles so there was no literature in India on how to trap for these turtles and like at least Sarju, this river was fine because it's kind of similar to the streams in the US. But the other huge, wide, deep rivers with super fast currents, like you cannot put hoop nets there. You can't put basking traps there. Like those are not feasible um, sampling techniques at all. So I was just, I started out with just trying to try different sampling methods. So I used two different mesh sizes of gill nets and I would deploy them at various heights. So I would sink them in various heights so that I covered the entire um, depth profile of the river. And then also this happened unintentionally because I was not catching enough turtles. I was sampling continuously. So in the five months, I think I just took two weeks off and that was like to go to the headquarters to like charge GPS and like buy stuff because the rural places that I was living in just had like two hours of electricity every day and no internet. So I would just kind of go for a few days to town for to civilization. But otherwise I sampled every day and in the night as well. So the assistants that I had would, would sleep on the boat actually. And um, they would sample all through the night as well. And then keep the turtles that they caught in, in the boat for me ready in the morning. And then I would come and process them in the morning. So because it was purely that I wanted to get more data. And then so that kind of gave me information on how which turtles are active at which parts of the day and night. So I kind of got the temporal partitioning. And then because I put nets in at different depths, I also was able to see at which depths these turtles were active. So specifically to the soft shells, um, the Ganges soft shell and the peacock soft shell are quite similar. Uh, they're both Nilsonia, Gangetica, and Hurum. And honestly, not much is known about how they coexist and what their feeding preferences are. They're just It's just the information is that they're carnivorous primarily. Uh, but what was interesting, what I, I found was that the peacock soft shells were mostly at the deeper, I would cast them more trawling towards the bottom of the rivers, whereas the Ganges soft shells were always feeding at the surface. And that was that was super interesting just to see that. And most of the hard shells, especially the punctures, um, they were always caught at the surface level nets. There's another monotypic genus, the Hardella thurgi, which very little is known about this species. Even the nesting, like um, there's someone right now working on it in India, but 
they were supposed to like nest underwater and like all of these cryptic things like we have no idea what the species does that species also never basks it's like never known to bask and it grows quite big so i would also always catch that species at the surface level so all of that was like interesting like you know the few anecdotal information that you've read from like the 1970s and 60s to actually corroborate that with like actual experiments and actual trapping data was was interesting that's actually i find that really interesting and with like you so you use gill nets and do you set like three different ones is it like all in one set or is it like in different parts of the river how, no, how so different, yeah it was kind of like a very badly designed random stratified set so i had like different stretches and then it, i just completely randomized it so at any given stretch i put one particular mesh net at a different height and then a different mesh net at a different height and then I, because they're gill nets um i would have to check them every three hours otherwise the turtles drown so uh we would leave the nets for i think maybe a good eight to ten hours in the day at a stretch and then again do it in the night um but we would check them every three hours um so i actually would know within a three hour period also which species which turtle i'm finding where and at which depth and in which stretch so I, I also deployed hoop nets and I built my own basking traps, which was um, kind of funny because sometimes really baby um, punctura turtles would like bask on top of my, my hoop nets and on top of my basking traps and then not fall into the trap. So it was definitely um, a lot of trial and error, but I did like the catch per unit effort thing and definitely the gill nets like one hands down because the type of rivers that india has um exactly. I, I, I found gill nets the most effective yeah yeah that doesn't seem that's in, that's really interesting to me because over here that's not as big of an issue it, like the, the majority mm -hmm. of the rivers aren't nearly that size yeah and uh i mean a lot of trapping and then surveying is done in smaller streams and where you where mm -hmm. hoop nets will really cover most of what you need you're yeah. not going to need to set any nets or anything but yeah uh, I also found it interesting that the peacock softshell and the Genji softshells, that you found that you would only seeing the peacock softshells up on the bottom of like the mm -hmm. water column or yeah. not near the top? No, yeah. Also, behavior-wise, the two of them are like known to have different behaviors. The Ganges soft softshell is is way, way more aggressive and the peacock softshell is, is more shy. Actually, each of the four Nilsonias have very unique behavior and it's like even if you catch one turtle you can very very clearly see that behavior so it's it's really fascinating but definitely more more studies need to look into this yeah. do you this so is do you think that do you think that the difference in this behavior is what caused like caused the the black soft shell and the peacock soft shell to be categorized in two different genuses like i think they used to be in two different genuses right yeah, I think uh, the blacks, I'm, I mean, I don't remember. I think the one was in Aspidiritis and then Trionix and yeah, it all, it all got a bit messy. But the black soft shell, actually this, me and my, my advisor from India, we've really talked about this quite a bit. So the black soft shell turtle, I mean, for as far as we can remember, since it was described, it was described from temple ponds in the 18, 1700s or whenever. And... Um, does it i mean why would a, a species that is found in the wild be so accustomed to just you know staying in in temple ponds or in community ponds so in india there are a lot they exist also in a lot of temp, like community ponds but there's no barriers they can leave anytime they want but people come and feed them every day and then they just stay there they, they do not leave at all so you can definitely see in the behavior that black soft shell turtles are they've kind of like become like dogs, you know, and it's been very easy for them to get habituated to humans and they're not afraid of humans. And that's probably the reason why that particular species, and I mean, this is just we're theorizing, but that's probably the reason why that they ended up even centuries ago in temple ponds. And whereas the peacock soft shell is, is a lot more aggressive, even um, the Ganges soft shell is, is quite aggressive if you catch them. Um, 
So these are just, I mean, things that we talk about, but definitely the behavior is something that's interesting. That's pretty, you've also done some other work at the temple ponds with the Ganges mm -hmm. soft shells, right? What, I, I didn't get actually a chance to read the paper. So it, I don't know what the kind of the, the conclusion mm -hmm. on that was, but that. No, so I, after my master's, I worked, um, for this, um, the National Mission for Clean Ganga, which is like a government funded project to clean the entire Ganga River stretch, which is hilarious. But um, that's the most amount of money the government has ever given for like aquatic research in India, like crores of rupees, which is like millions of rupees. So I was working with this institute called Wildlife Institute of India, which is like the only federal institute for wildlife studies in India. And I was just hired as the turtle crocodile biologist. So I was just one person for the entire river stretch from its headwaters in Uttarakhand all the way till uh, the Bay of Bengal. So that's like 2,400 kilometer stretch. And I was the only person to look at turtles and crocodiles for this entire stretch. And again, when you look at literature, all of the information on their distribution of species on the Ganges is like from 30 years ago there's no updated information at all. And based on like, from some researchers that I had heard, heard that I had done some work, a lot of species were like extant from um, a lot of states, particular states. So the whole point of my work, I worked there for two years and all we did was just do expedition. So we would just do like complete boat. We would just sail on the boat from the top till the bottom. Uh, and we, we had certain 17 sampling stretches where we did intensive sampling, but otherwise we would just like sail along downstream and I would just do visual assessments of turtles. So I got a lot of cool information. I was also trapping turtles at those, at those 17 um, locations. So it was interesting. And then when I used to stay in base camps all across, like especially in a few states like Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, um, every village or town, small village that we stopped at had, you know, a temple pond or a community pond. And there were just turtles because whenever I would talk to locals or a shopkeeper and be like, oh, I'm working on turtles. And like, I would sometimes go to the fisher markets also to see if, you know, people are still selling turtles or like what's happening and just talk to fishermen about it. And they would just immediately tell me like, oh, you work on turtles. There's like a whole bunch of turtles in this pond, go there. And so I started like, trying to map these, um, you know, turtle ponds and these temple and community ponds. And it was, it was crazy. It was, I mean, I hadn't even known that this was, I knew that there was some turtle ponds that existed, but I didn't know they were so widespread. And in fact, like, I think someone should still, uh, maybe I, I need to write this up, but there's a lot more community ponds than we can even imagine. And there's like insane number of tiny, tiny turtle populations in all of these community ponds that are just living their entire lives in those ponds. So um, the paper was just something that we wanted to write up just to document this, like do at least to start to documenting it. And the whole point was that it can be a tool for conservation, like instead of having XC2 conservation projects, if we just involve local communities to manage these community ponds better, because a lot of them already have this sense of protection, like nobody's allowed to get like poached turtles from those ponds like because uh, turtles in India have like a religious significance that's the whole reason why people actually rescue turtles and then just dump them in the ponds and then that's how they those populations have begun so people are very very fond of the turtles people go there and feed them every day and they're very protective about it so that sentiment is already there so it was just more of the paper was just trying to like get get a few thoughts down on how we can like actually turn community ponds and temple ponds into a tool for conservation yeah that's it's very interesting we we last week and it, the, the ponds are great too because you have so many there but also mm -hmm. a lot of times actually species have been rediscovered there too right yeah. we we talked to St Steve Platt last week, and he, I, I think that one of the first Burmese river tur uh, roof turtles yeah. that they found was in one. So yeah. not only a great tool for kind of bolstering kind of assurance colonies and such, XC2, mm -hmm. but also for, you never yeah. know what kind of diversity you're going to have in there, right? That That's yeah. really interesting. 
even the northern river terrapin the butagor basca species that's like in the top endangered species list and all that's only found in the mangroves uh, of india the sundarbans of india and bangladesh um there's like an organization that says that oh we were the first to find them like you know rediscover them and all that no the local people knew that they were in their backyard ponds for like donkey's years so okay donkey's years i recently learned is an indian expression that um, it just means like crazy amount of years so local people even though they might not know the scientific name of the species they definitely can distinguish between species they have their own local names for it and they know that these species exist so yeah it's just we could we could learn a lot more by just you know going to these ponds and just talking to the people about it because people feed them every day they notice almost everything about the species right that's i think that's the key with conservation right that the local people are going to know so much more than than anyone coming externally and trying to do yeah. that i think that's great um i so with your like the master's work i'm mm -hmm. kind of jumping back i guess but so you mentioned like the you worked in the two tributaries and that mm -hmm. you all uh that there was sort of a did you find i don't think we got did you find a difference in community composition between both tributaries or was it kind of similar yeah so definitely i feel like in sarju river i think i found like two or three more species and i definitely found uh this the hardella species and uh, the indian eye turtle which are pretty rare species and hadn't been like spotted for quite some years and i only found them in sarju because I feel like their diets are pretty niche and um, there's only certain specific vegetation that they primarily feed on or that they prefer that is absent from these fast flowing rivers. So I, there were a couple, I think two or three species that I didn't find in Ghagra. But another thing was that in Ghagra, the the species that I found, the rare species, the, other than the Pankshuras, which I found like a buttload of them, uh, the other species that I found more commonly in Sarju were hardly like one, just one or two and in like very, very far out, uh, spread out locations. So it was kind of just like chance um, trappings. Whereas in Sarju, all seven of those species, seven, eight of those species were found all across the, the river stretches that I was sampling and in equal amount of numbers. So definitely the populations in, in Sarju are, are thriving and... Um, I don't know. I still need to. I wasn't able to really look into the diet aspect of it because I, I had an advisor who was like, "Let's do stable isotope work," even though that's like none, no work has been done in India on it. So I collected some skewed samples, and then I collected a, a whole bunch of array of like possible diet samples from from both of these streams and did the work. But then. I mean, the institute we were collaborating with just gave us the carbon nitrogen values and all we could do was just put them in broad feeding categories and say that, okay, this is primarily a herbivore, this is primarily a carnivore and this is ambiguous. So it it wasn't really that helpful. Uh, we didn't get like unique signatures, matches or any detailed carbon nitrogen isotope values from that institute. So I, I really hope that there's more work into seeing how um, the food diet resources are, are partitioned among these turtles, because that I think will give us more insight into how the habitat niches also differ amongst these rivers. Right. I think that there's a good, in, in kind of going through my, my pond turtle work, mm -hmm. I did the looking at interspecies interactions between sliders and pond turtles in Southern California. Um, but there's some good kind of literature from, I think it's Pianca and he kind of summarizes, right. When you look at where there's areas that you're going to have limited resources for overlap, it's space, time and diet. Right. Mm -hmm. so, and I think that your work was really interesting in terms of how you kind of, you went through and kind of dissected those categories and you mm -hmm. kind of got that, the time and the space, but diet's like a whole different thing, right? So yeah. that, that's kind of a different study. Yeah. Um, but that's cool. It, the menor, the not menoria, the morania, that, that's a really cool, th the, the Peter's eye. What, yeah. what was the story behind that? That sounds like a, 
so that was actually the first turtle i caught in december it was so cold and in fact i only caught the morinias in the hoop traps which was very very surprising cuz um i think i placed the hoop traps um, mainly towards the banks the edges of the rivers um because like you have to like put the like i had never done hoop net and i didn't have anyone to show me how to do it so i didn't like the rivers are quite deep i was like there's no way i'm going to be able to like half like put the nail like you have to fix it right in the sand in the substrate and i was like there's no way i can go that deep and like fix it down so i mainly put it like towards the banks where i could manage and i feel like that's where the morinia are are quite active and um also december is reportedly their nesting time so probably that's why they were active during that time because no other species hardly are uh, just a few punctures but no other species got active until it started getting warmer in like mid jan so um i was shocked like i honestly did not expect to find that like when i saw it in the trap i was just like fascinated because it's like a species that i had only seen on paper and it was so beautiful like their whole plastron is like bright yellow and like they have these pretty yellow circles on their uh, marginal scutes so on the coastal so i was uh, yeah not not much to say it was just interesting that and also they reported to be primarily herbivores but the hoop traps were baited with like sardines and like uh, fish so it's interesting that they and they did eat eat it in the hoop traps so that was that was interesting information yeah i'm i'm also curious too so you mentioned you were cuz this is kind of far from the work you were doing was kind of far from where you were actually at school right so this yeah. was you were staying in these rural villages and what were yeah. some of the adventures like what was some of the what was that experience like not fun not fun at all like growing up in mumbai i was i mean used to certain comforts for sure uh, but also firstly living in a very rural place from the masters itself and like living in forest that was like uh, i i kind of got used to it and i liked it but living in uttar pradesh in those kind of rural villages was a whole another ball change like the houses the villages that i were in have no toilets like no toilets are constructed in those villages so i would literally have to leave when it was dark in the morning and then do my business along the river cuz that's where all all the people do their business and literally a lot of times when i had placed like my um nets and then i would have to wait till i got my first batch of turtles i would just walk along the river bank to also see if i could see basking turtles and it's like i just have to dodge if it was near a village I basically instead of focusing on the bank I had to look make sure that I don't step in shit cuz it's like it's absolutely rural areas where all of the kids kind of like dump take a dump near the near the river and um so that was fascinating having no electricity it being so cold like cold that I like a cold that I'm not used to and like not having heaters or anything cuz there's no electricity so you just sit by the fire all night and then you just go straight into bed and and somehow try to get sleep and it's also i would say up uttar pradesh is like the most unsafe safe uh, state for women in india it's the most unsafe state so yeah like a lot of times when i would get turtles and i'm marking them there's a lot of like unemployed youth and men who just sit by the river and i would get followed all the time there would be people who would just stare at me like 10 20 people would just gather around me and just stare at me all day and just watch what i'm doing all day so to have that kind of male gaze on you like 24/7 was was exhausting honestly um there were times where i had i had to walk back to my the house that i was staying almost like 4 kilometers walk every day and my my boatman was supposed to walk back with me in the night in the evening when it was dusk because it was not safe but we would work so hard all day and then they would have to sample in the night as well so i used to feel bad for them so half way through i kind of would tell them you know hey don't i I'll, i'll walk by myself but once like i was walking through like fields and then there was a group of boys that were like chasing me and there was literally nothing i could do like i mean touch wood nothing happened but i literally ran to someone's house and just stayed there for some time till those boys left so 
I mean, these are stories that I haven't even told my parents because I mean, now I can tell them, but at that time, if I told them, they would have been like, come back home immediately. Like, there's no way you're going to keep working in this place. Uh, but I, I guess I was naive and also way too overconfident to think that anything could ever happen to me. But like now looking back, I put myself in some really, really dangerous situations um, all because I was just like, oh, I want to study turtles. So, yeah, a lot of advice that I give young people nowadays is this, you know, you put, put yourself first and we have to ensure safe working conditions for people no matter no matter who they are and where they go. Sorry, what was the question? I drifted off completely. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's, that's a really that, interesting perspective. I think that hit exactly what we were looking for, just trying to hear some interesting stories, I guess, about oh, yeah. Rod's perspective that would really get from anywhere else. So, yeah. Well, I, I mean, there were nice things. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I mean, like, I mean, you did mention it's different for, it got to be different for women in some of those areas than if, like, mm -hmm. uh, like I mean, it's probably, I mean, you'd probably be more of a target for some people. Like, yeah. it's just like that in those areas. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's just interesting to hear about. But I yeah, mean, yeah, that's got to be, that's got to be scary. Some of those situations must have been. Yeah. For them, it was unheard of, uh, like, because women generally don't leave the house, even girls, like, they go to school and they come back and then they're married off, most of them in those those particular villages. So for them to see a woman being independent and going out and doing work by the river, getting inside the river and all was kind of, like, shocking for them. And there were certainly people who disapproved, but luckily, like, um, you know, nothing happened. But there were also good, good times, like, I, if you just sat by the river in Sarju, there would be like, and you just scan your binoculars on the river surface, like you could identify species by, like they would come up to surface and bask or uh, bask along the water as well, or just, you know, from their snouts, you could identify at least like five, six species just sitting by the bank. So that was, that was really special. There were, um, there was once where so a lot of fishermen also, I mean, there was some kind of like subsistence level poaching and hunting going on over there where some people would eat turtle meat. Uh, I didn't really concern myself because I felt it was not my place there to, you know, get into um, the customs and, and life of these people that have been doing this for years. So um, a lot of them did put like, they put like hook, um, just a fishing line with the hook with bait and mainly to catch big fish. But... A lot of times turtles would also obviously get stuck on on the hooks and get get trapped on those hook lines so uh whenever there's like a large ganges soft shell that would get trapped i think most of them i spoke to fishermen like they're all too scared to catch them because these guys bite like crazy and th like their necks are so long so uh these guys would just cut the thread off and then the turtle would just have the hook in its mouth and they didn't they didn't care about it because they were just way too scared to handle it. So once I was there and like someone came in, a kid came and told me that, you know, there's a turtle in one of the hooks and they're going to cut it. So I immediately rushed to the place. And then I had to really like for 10 minutes convince those guys that I am capable of catching the turtle. And they were like deadly afraid. They were like, no, you will get bitten and no, then we'll have to take you to the hospital. And, you know, they were just freaked out. I assured them I went in the water. I caught the turtle it was like struggling quite a bit I caught it removed the neck uh, the hook somehow and like in that much time I think some of the kids went to the village and there was like at least like 40 people come there to like stand and watch me do this because they were shocked that you know a girl could catch a huge Ganges soft shell turtle by herself and like you know so it yeah I've had like some good times too yeah yeah that's awesome uh did you ever have do they catch Kicha or anything on those hooks like or you, like Kicha uh, indica the narrowness oh, so that species i didn't come across in either Not of those the tributaries um, uh, no i came across them in uh, my work on the ganges so it's a very very sensitive species like it definitely needs very very pristine sand banks um, and very undisturbed habitat. So any any river stretches that are kind of disturbed, they've, they've kind of disappeared from those stretches. So um, yeah, only along the main stretch of the Ganges was where I found I was catching Chitra Indica l later on in my work. And I also um, 
a couple of times while I was walking and there are like these shallow pools um, along the sides of the rivers that haven't dried up yet. I actually found two hatchlings once um, in awesome. pools. So like really, really tiny. That means they're just like hatched like maybe a week before or something. And those stretches are like just like sand for miles and like the nearest town is probably 20 kilometers away. So there were only, even during my time in the entire Ganges, um, only in the upper stretches of Uttar Pradesh, in upper stretches of Ganges, um, where there hasn't been much development activity, I think there were like three locations where I could see that there are populations left, but otherwise nowhere else um, in, along the Ganges. And did you guys capture them through, other than those hatchlings, was it the gill nets that they yeah, were catching? Yeah. Okay, that... Because I, I had actually always been curious for a long time, how would you even go about trying to catch them? And yeah. they get so massive, too, and there's so much. It's a whole magnitude mm -hmm. greater in terms of strength and power than, like, Macrochelys or something. We would, the largest yeah. freshwater turtles we'd catch, capture in North America. And I, I just couldn't see a hoop net or anything really working for them. Yeah. And, so, I mean, uh, I used to put, like, eight-inch mesh um, gill nets, which would catch turtles that would, be at least 60 to 70 centimeters long but definitely there were much bigger soft shells in the river in at least in the ganges river that i was serving and there there was once where the nets were torn and we weren't sure whether it was a turtle or not uh but my my assistants were pretty certain that it was a large soft shell that tore through those turtles so uh, tore through those nets and uh, there are like certain stretches where um so in India, a lot of people, um, so when you burn, uh, like when you have your funeral last rites, you cremate the person and then the ashes are dumped in, in the river, especially in the Ganges, because it's the holiest river in India. And there's this particular city called Varanasi where um, like a lot of Ganges soft shell turtles are reported from because, so people who are too poor or unclaimed bodies they kind of are like half cremated. They're not cremated fully or sometimes some murder victims or something like every day there are quite a few number of bodies that are just submerged as it is without cremation or some of them are halfly burnt and then dumped in the river. So these Ganges soft shell turtles, like it's been in literature, it's been reported like centuries ago. So by um, the Britishers who came here on expeditions and stuff that these Ganges soft shell turtles would um, feed on these corpses. So um, definitely there were times where I sat along the bank and I could see like the head surfacing of a Ganges soft shell turtle that it's probably the biggest Ganges soft shell turtle I've seen. But again, I spoke to fishermen there and they're like, there's no way you can catch. There's like, he's like, there's no net that exists that could catch these Ganges soft shell turtles. They're that big. And so I I never even attempted to, because like you can see the head of that thing and you know that it's massive and yeah, there's no way. There's no point. There's no way yeah. you're going to catch it. Yeah. I mean, even, uh, I mean, even when they, like this was in the last 10 years when uh, they were trying to capture that the one raffidus that remained yeah. in uh, Hanoi in Vietnam, the, even though it was a small area that was pretty contained, I mean, yeah, we're talking about a turtle yeah. or more, and it just tore through most of the nets until they, yeah. they eventually got lucky and managed to catch it. But yeah, yeah unless you're using I'd like, be curious. Uh, oh, go on. I was going to say, I'd be curious to see if like, I'm not sure if this would be ethically or morally sound but if like they are feeding on the corpses if you could like somehow weight one down to like a shallower part of the river system mm -hmm. or like if they're particularly drawn to the bodies i wonder if you could like in a way like use that as a bait to get them into like water where you could actually like catch them and pull them out that that would work i mean so we have records on so on ftti on the uh, biodiversity which is our community science thing we do have records of like ganges soft shell turtles eat feeding on like dead cattle that are in the river um because people like when their cattle die also they just like shove them in the river so um we have records of that so we wouldn't need a cough so we can like use <laughs> use livestock too but um, most turtles and especially the ganges soft shell turtle is scheduled one on the indian wildlife protection act so to i would have to justify why i'm doing it and i would need a, a huge team like you would need a crazy amount of people and time and resources to do that 
and like that ha- i haven't had the need to do that yet i might have to do that for my i mean my doctoral research i'm planning to like do satellite telemetry for some of the soft shell turtles um i'm planning to tag rescue turtles that i get so the area that i work in now in assam in northeast india a lot of uh, soft shell turtles are rescued from agricultural fields along the brahmaputra so the past two years like i've been going and i was in trapping turtles because i didn't have permits for it and um i would just like forest departments would call me whenever like people rescue turtles and then i would go measure them and then we would go release them so my plan is to tag those turtles but then i might also try to get capture some big ones from the community ponds and then release them in the wild i don't know we'll we'll see if i get permits for that with and this is kind of just a simple question but yeah. with the ganji soft shell turtles i mean i've heard they can get upwards of like 90 centimeters in carapace yeah. length and weigh yeah. like i don't remember what it would be in kilograms but like mm-hmm. somewhere like 100 plus pounds, 100 pounds or 50 yeah. pounds. do they yeah. really is that common for them to get close to that size or yeah yeah crazy it's uh like the chitra indica i think is reported to be the like the biggest individuals found um there's like a viral photo that's like from a bunch of years ago actually i was just checking i had like a conversation with grover i was trying to find interesting trivia facts and like i had a conversation with grover like a couple of years back and i found a photo that i had sent him um I don't know if you guys can see this but uh, no okay never mind I'll send it to you guys later but it's like yeah. a huge chitra indica that's like in the back of a truck so it's like it's massive but even the black so I I once got a rescue black soft shell turtle that was about 70 70 meters and it weighed 48 kg which is close to 100 pounds yeah that's so, massive yeah they they can get pretty huge like we needed like three people to lift it and like how do you even uh, this is these are just such basic questions i'm asking but yeah. how do you go about because any any turtle that size i've ever interacted with is not a soft shell and yeah. even, even small soft shells are, are are kind of challenging to to interact with and, and yeah. get a grip on like i mean if we're talking about like some kind of sea turtle or alligator mm-hmm. snapping turtles or even common snapping turtles you have a steady carapace you can get a firm grip on yeah and they don't they aren't quite as mobile or as fast as yeah. like like do you like how do you even pick one of those up like so the the good thing is that when they're that big even though their reflexes are super fast they're still kind of slow like it's pretty slow to move around because they're just so fucking huge so a lot of times we just like have them we just make makeshift things like india rural areas in india the, some of the men are just like crazy innovative and they just come up with makeshift things so a lot of times what we do is we use gunny bags so i don't know if you know like jute bags they're made of jute material which you used to store grains in mm-hmm. um so that kind of that it's kind of like cloth material and it's very thick it's made out of jute so you get those at like any local grocery store so we would get those huge bags and then we would put the turtle in them and then you can soak the bag so that it remains moist and then two three people would just be able to lift the bag uh so that's how we would transport them or we would like have a huge bed sheet or a cloth and then tie ropes at the end and then put the turtle in between and then like kind of make like a yeah like a carry carrying system for the turtle that's like, like yeah, carry, no right? one person would be able to hold it like these the, the the sizes i'm talking about are huge like i don't think i would be able to lift one by myself yeah yeah that's i mean i mean i've heard like from some of the old stories in vietnam of how they used to they used to capture i mean hunters used to capture the raffidus there's all kinds of like the biggest ones like they get to a size where you can't actually you can't pick them up they're they're too big they're like the size of some livestock animals so they'd have to like puncture the carapace and have and attach uh ropes to the horns of a a buffalo or something yeah uh, have it haul it out of the water like that's yeah. there's nothing here you need to do that for <laughs> like, that's just ridiculous. <laughs> yeah yeah we can take so i guess something that's like what would be what are kind of the major threats that to, to turtles within india and it are they is india really conservation minded i guess with respect to turtles or kind of what is the situation there 
So it's it's slowly changing. I mean, at least the work that we've been doing is trying to like if I even though I was in like wildlife, at least I was a birder and I had some knowledge of India's wildlife. I had absolutely no clue that India had like 28, 29 species of turtles and tortoises. Like definitely the general public also has no idea. So the main point of FTTI is also to just get out, do outreach and awareness so that more people know them. And that kind of hopefully will in translate in the next few years to having more people care about turtles. Because I would say inside India and in, domestically, um, habitat fragmentation and habitat loss is, is a, a big threat to turtles. There's a lot of sand mining that goes on on the major rivers and huge chunks of you know prime nesting areas are being lost especially for a species like chitra indica that's so sensitive to these things and other soft shell turtles um that's definitely a pressing concern um i would say there's a lot of places that still do eat turtles but i still think that that subsistence subsistence level hunting that's something that's a question that i do want to explore and you know do it with respect and and empathy and like really try to live with communities and understand um, why and what are their motivations behind, you know, eating turtles. But um, I, I would say that that definitely is not a threat to turtles. It's more of there are a few um, places along a certain rivers where definitely it is exploitative. People are either picking up puncturas by the hundreds for a pet trade for international and domestic pet trade, which is kind of also booming now. And um, flap shell turtles and some soft shells are also collected by the hundreds from certain stretches um, to go to different parts of India or Bangladesh or a few other markets in India where people do consume turtles. So that demand and supply is something that I feel like needs to be looked into more. And I would say that is another pressing major threat for turtles especially because adult turtles are being removed by the hundreds and thousands from certain river stretches but in general i would say like subsistence level hunting isn't isn't really a big threat from from my experience and a lot of indians now are especially in urban areas or in metro cities are buying turtles as pets because it's becoming more and more popular in india and this wasn't the case at least seven eight years back when i started so Red eared sliders are becoming a huge issue. Like we've we've got them, we've got reports on the India biodiversity portal from even remote places in Northeast India, where it's like we don't know what are that you get like an insane number of turtle species there because that's the world's after the Mississippi Basin, that's the next turtle global hotspot. There's like 21, 22 species that you get in in a particular state and I'm, we are finding red ear sliders there. So that's that's insane that people are buying them. People are still buying a lot of puncture turtles. People are buying the star tortoise a lot, even though all of it is illegal. Um, other than the red ear slider, it's illegal to own native species. Um, so we're kind of trying our best to like sensitize people against that. Like the more urban people and educated people uh, that we can reach out to, to so that the pet trade kind of the demand stops. I know it's it's a long shot, but we're trying. So, I, I mean, I think any sort of initiative to do that is something worthwhile, right? And and FTTF India is doing some great work, not only through the biodiversity portal, but on on social media as well. I know I've I've interacted a bit on there too. So, but but yeah, no, I mean it's a great place, and and we'll definitely plug this in the show notes and such to find. But great for information about the turtles as well. Um, but that's that's really interesting. I think that I was looking through uh, Edward and Don Mole's book, it, The Conservation of, of Turtles, and they've got some okay. really interesting statistics in there about the trade. I, I think they had a case study from Bangladesh, and it was a, I, that at, when the not maybe not during the peak of the trade, but at one point, one hundred and thirty two thousand pounds or so of turtle were coming through these yeah. railways every month. Yeah. And this was just in one railway port in, in Bangladesh and a lot were coming from India but it's just it, and a lot of this goes underground too like we don't catch yeah. maybe 
90 percent of the trade right so yeah that's certainly something and then the sand mining is interesting in the sense that may, that doesn't get i don't think talked about as much we kind of assume right that that's sort of destruction of habitat that's and, something yeah. really good in terms of like with, with the sand mining do you know where that's going like i've heard all, i've heard lots of like rumors that i don't like they're like oh well uh in, in lots of places mm -hmm. that are developing fast in like china they, they need the sand for concrete uh yeah. I know it's used for concrete, but is it is that all like where is yeah. it specifically coming from or do we No, it's it's mainly for construction activities. That's what it's used for. So um I have a lot of friends that are working on Gharias in the Ganges and in other upper tributaries of um the Ganges and Gharials are also like the Chitra where so do you know Gharials are the crocodiles that have the very slender snouts and they're mainly like only fish eating. And they're like a genus of, of their family of their own. So you have crocodiles, alligators, and then gharials. So uh, they are also very, very sensitive to their habitat. And they, they need those pristine sandbanks for nesting and um, raising their young and everything. So, but the sand, there's actually like sand mafias. And um, even bureaucrats that have stood up to them or gone for inspections or tried to do something about it have been murdered or killed in certain parts of India. So it's a very, very lucrative business. And I, it makes sense why no researcher would want to, I mean, we should collectively, it's not like something that one person should do on their own. Collectively as scientists, we should be talking about it and pushing um, the government and bureaucracy and the police to be more strict about all of this, but, and find alternative options also. But um, definitely, I don't see why a single researcher should take the risk to to do to talk about sand mining when when it's so so dangerous. Yeah. Right. That's a that's a good way. I think I so. Think we can. We've got some some. I guess a, as a last question, and then we'll get mm -hmm. into. We can do a rapid fire listener question. Okay. And go into, <laughs> yeah. uh, but the last thing is like uh, in terms of conservation, sort of as a field, where do you think that? It, not necessarily within the it, it, wherever kind of wherever you want to take this, go ahead with it. But conservation as a field, what should we be doing in order to kind of progress that in, in as we kind of get for, forward, right? Oh well, oh I can talk about this for ages. Well, currently in in India, I would say that for a long time, um, research on on reptiles or even on turtles was just you know concentrated by a few individuals and. Um, the atmosphere wasn't really inclusive for more young researchers to to choose them as study species and and work on them. Whereas in India, when you look at mammals and birds and insects, a, a whole bunch of other taxa, a lot of you have a lot of young researchers working on them, but that's somehow lacking for um, turtles. And when you look at snakes and other reptiles, it's we recently had a paper that came out that showed that herpetology is male dominated in India. I don't know if you have seen the paper, but I'll send it to Michael. And um, it, it wasn't shocking because we we lack female mentors, female museum curators, female faculty, and um, it it isn't the field isn't as inclusive as as we want, would want it to be. So I definitely feel like for conservation to be effective, you not only need to be inclusive and have more researchers working on it, but diverse researchers and especially researchers from local communities or from states where turtles are most abundant and where people already know these rivers and their backyard rivers really well. And I feel like getting those those researchers working on turtle conservation is, is really important. Um, when it comes to, I would say, organizational or like funding level support, um, that is definitely lacking in India. A lot of forest departments still work very through a colonial system where it's still, you know, all protected areas and, you know, the whole fortress conservation system. And um, they're mainly focused on tiger or mammal or like elephant rhino conservation and turtle somehow. Uh, that awareness and training hasn't been given to a lot of forest departments where, um, you know, to explain why turtles or huge softshell turtles are also important for river health and for the ecosystem health in general and all of the ecosystem services they provide. So a lot of times, even if a researcher like I have gone to national parks to unprotected areas to want to survey and people are baffled like, oh, you come here to study turtles and, and not the tigers and not the rhinos. 
so that kind of you know mammal obsession and big fauna obsession is still pretty much prevalent in india and that needs to change so when that changes then automatically like funding and other kinds of support institutional support will also trickle in for turtles which i think right now is lacking a lot in india that's very interesting. It's, uh, I think a good overview. Thanks for thanks for that. Um, so I guess we can go into our, our rapid fire. We actually had a lot of listener questions, but we could just do these quick it, it, yeah. and then we can get into our. But uh, the, the first one was in regards to the Indian, the Indian roof turtle uh, mm -hmm. or Panchura tecta. So, someone was curious how common they are in the wild and if they have different habitat use in, with respect to the brown roof turtle. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Indian roof turtle is actually the only the so there's three punctura that are common throughout the north and northeast region and northeast has the fourth punctura the punk Assam roof turtle that's only found in a particular the Brahmaputra drainage but the other three are found in the Ganges and the Brahmaputra floodplains. And weirdly enough, punk the brown roof turtle punctura tecta doesn't have any subspecies, although I feel like that needs to be looked into. Uh, and they are pretty common. I would say all the three puncturas are very, very common across uh, the entire north and northeast East India. Like if you had to take a, a boat ride down the Ganges or any major river for at least a 20 kilometer stretch, you definitely on, on a hot sunny day, you would see them basking for sure. And a lot of them do bask together, which is also something that needs to be looked into because I know that even with the map turtles here which are quite similar to the entire punctura genus like i've seen that they have different basking preferences and and things like that i think that kind of also needs to be looked at for the puncturas because it's weird that all three of them would bask in the same area or in coexist in the same small small river stretches but yeah the punctura tecta is, is pretty common and as far as i know I haven't found any differences like in terms of their diet or basking preferences from the other two, from the Indian tent turtle and the brown roof turtle. But definitely it, it needs to be looked into. Yeah. Interesting. Kind of an open it. This, the yeah. second one was in, uh, it, about the, the Indian spotted turtles, the geoclamies, and mm -hmm. what the lowest temperatures they can handle in, the, in, in water are. So. I this, I don't know the answer to that. I don't think anybody does. But I do know that the, um, there's very few Indian turtles that do like estivate or, um, you know, hunker down for winter like you see here in America. Um, there are just a few of them because like the puncturas and uh, hardella and all are active even in, in winters, like you'll see them basking or even the soft shells. But I do know that the geoclemis do burrow and like do go into some burrows for for the winter so i I'm, I'm not really sure whether they are underwater submerged in the winter or not um but yeah if in in winters i would say north north india is the coldest that it gets and it i can't say in fahrenheit but probably it would go into like zero or minus two the water temperatures but then again i don't know what the deeper water temperatures are and whether they submerge there or are they burrowed uh, buried in in a burrow somewhere on land for the winter so interesting they can take it pretty cool it sounds like for, yeah. for a period of time i'm, I'm guessing yeah yeah Yes. Okay, and then the last, the last one I think we'll get to now is the in regard to the cane turtle and kind of what's mm -hmm. known about it. Yeah, so the Cochin cane turtle is is pretty fascinating. I haven't seen one in in the wild yet. Um, that's still a checklist of mine. Um, so y'all all know about Jay Vijaya, who was like India's first female turtle biologist back in the eighties, eighties, nineties. Yeah. And um, so the, the cane turtle hadn't been like known for decades, like it was described and then it hadn't been seen for decades by anybody. And so Vijaya was the one who rediscovered it and she went to the type locality in, in Western Ghats. So it's endemic to the Western Ghats. Um, interestingly, the other two species that are endemic to India are also found in the Western Ghats. We have a Nilsonia 
a soft shell, Leeds soft shell turtle, and the Travancore tortoise. So the Travancore tortoise and the Vijaya chalice, uh, the cane turtle, do overlap in their distribution. Um, and so the cane turtle is, was primarily a terrestrial turtle and um, kind of like box turtles, I guess. Uh, but they're really tiny and they're very cryptic and very hard to find. So I think she, you know, stayed in like roamed around the type locality and um, really just lived in the forest till she found a few. And then she even like built enclosures inside the forest and would stay there and like look at like learn about their behavior in C2 you know, enclosures inside the forest where they had their same microhabitats and everything. And then she learned more about them. So that that was really interesting. Like her loss was was definitely huge. I feel like if she were alive today, we would have a lot more turtle researchers and a lot more women turtle researchers for sure. Yeah. There was a really good kind of overview. I, I forget what the website is, but somebody wrote a yeah. large yeah it was it was really good i read through that and yeah. for the short time that she was doing work it really tragic i think what happened but it just really incredible she was mentored by Ed, edward mall i think who got yeah, her to the u.s for um a master's and then she was also the person who first photographed you know sea turtles being um so sea turtles would be butchered across the eastern coast because they came, the Aribada happens on the east coast of India where they come for mass nesting, the olive ridley turtles, and um, people would just, you know, hunt them and, and eat the meat and get the eggs. And she, like, one of the photos that she clicked of, like, these markets of sea turtles uh, reached the Prime Minister of India then, Indira Gandhi, and that's when a lot of the laws and, protections against sea turtle hunting and all of that came through so she was really a formidable woman um yeah sad sad loss for conservation yes all right so i think we can transition into the sometimes we do like a back and forth but since okay. you're kind of on time here you maybe you could just ask us a few questions and we'll do that for the okay so i mean i don't have anything super interesting i don't know i feel like y'all are Y'all know way too much that y'all will probably know the answers to most of this. But I have some random ones that even I don't know the answers to. So maybe that's something you guys can figure out. Um, let's start with like an easy one, um, which is the large... So I say Chelonian. I've heard that y'all say Chelonian, which is interesting. What's the largest or heaviest Chelonian that y'all think we get in India? Um are are we speaking of just for, of, of everything like including the sea turtles yeah hmm. if that's we actually a pretty good question that's actually that actually that that complicates it a bit yeah um because if we were thinking just freshwater turtles and tortoises i'd have said kicha indica yeah but if, right. you're including, if you're including sea turtles mm -hmm. then i know the greens and I don't know if you guys get leatherbacks at all. Like we even, do get leatherbacks. Okay, we get them in the islands. So it's the leatherback. Yeah, that was kind of like an easy question, but also a trick question. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, the Chitra Indica would be right. And if it were, what if it was the tortoise, the largest tortoise we get? I would take that one, Mark. Probably the Minoria, I think. I Yes. Yeah. So we get we get two Minoria now. I don't know if you all heard that in 2019 we got the new country record for the impressed tortoise in India, which is baffling that a tortoise this big was not reported from India for, for so long. So that again goes to show that we have so much to do and so much to know, especially in Northeast India when it comes to tortoises. Yeah. I was actually, I can't remember exactly that, but I was sitting with, I, I was with uh, some guys from the turtle conservancy when that happened. And that was like a topic of discussion at the, the 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 table in 2019 when that happened yeah <laughs> it, it was a lot of drama i think we can avoid talking about it. yeah yeah okay so yeah we can do a few more questions here i guess and then okay uh which is the only hard shell species in the world i'm i'm hoping this is right to have 13 pairs of marginal scutes oh yeah that's like <laughs> 
Oh man. Well, there's 356 options. Um, yeah. As far as I know, this is the only one from what I've read. So. Well, okay. Yeah, this is a, a good question because I'm. I, I don't know about anyone else, but I'm. I, this is not something that's. Okay, I'll give you all a hint. It's an Indian species. Yeah, I I figured that would be the case. Um, yeah. Is it a monotypic genus? Like, is it a single species? No. Okay, okay so well, that actually, that narrows it down a bit, huh? Well, it's none of those. The, we can narrow down all the trinekids. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I have sort of an idea, but I think that I don't think this is right. I feel like. Uh, well, that if it's not a monotypic genus and it's not the soft shells, that does narrow it down a lot. So. Yeah, and it's not a tortoise, so. Okay. I. Okay, yeah, I think that, I mean, technically, well, the, 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 it's not, I know it's not Lismies, but technically they do have kind of residual martial bones, but that, I, that's, they have like six, yeah. so. No, uh, no, it's not a soft shell. I've got an idea of it, but I think that it's probably not right. Well, it's, yes. Yeah, I, I was thinking the Milana Kelly's, the Trajuga. No. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, should I tell you guys what it is? Yeah. Oh, you want to keep guessing? I was going to say, I just don't want to say something that's going to be blatantly wrong. I mean, think. It's so okay, say it. Just go for it, Jack, if you have a, have a guess. Is it the Indo Testudo? Like, no, no, it's not a tortoise. No. Okay. It's the Assam roof turtle, the Punctura silitensis. And oh that's God. also really interesting. So, like, they're the only Punctura that their marginal scutes are highly serrated. And it's, it's probably like, again, this is just me and my advisor shit talking where like we've seen the Assam roof turtles like basking on logs that are like sometimes even like pretty vertical and they mainly bask on like log logs or rocks, like never on the sand. So it's probably like, I don't know, like to prevent them like grip or something. I don't know. We've, we've not figured that out. And so probably, I don't know why 13, but maybe that helps. I don't know. That, that's that's a great little tidbit of random. No, that's that's what we're going for. So that's that's a really good. That's a really good one right there. How about a, how about one or two more? If that. Okay. Well, I have a few more um, okay. from India. Okay. So which turtle in India, or I mean, even globally, if y'all can, I might learn something. Shows extreme sexual dimorphism when it comes to size. Oh, go ahead, okay. Jackie. Uh, if you're talking about yeah, so. Uh, Hardella, the, the yes, the yes, yeah. They it's actually probably yeah. it might be more here, extreme. Too. It might be more extreme than the sexual dimorphism in Grabdemes. Yeah. I mean, that's just that's really well documented. But the sizes mm -hmm. that those female Hardella reach, yeah, it's, it's like almost volume. three times more. Yeah, it's much Maybe. bigger than even a than even the Grabdemes get, and just basic like mm -hmm. surface area to volume ratio. Even if the the carapace length difference might not be the same, or yeah. you might have a you might have a female barber's mat that's twelve inches or so, and a male that's three or four. But if you're talking like six to eight inches for a male versus like I don't know what is it yeah. like eighteen to twenty four for yeah. a female, that's a significant yeah. increase in body mass that's going to be much greater than the difference between a male and female and in, in the map turtles. So. Yeah. Yeah, there's a place in India where you can like stand on a bridge where there's a population and um, in, in their breeding season in the summer, like you can see the females like about this, this big sometimes. And then there's like three tiny males like this big coating her and like swimming around her and trying to like mount her. It's, it's hilarious. That's funny. All right. How about a few more? Okay, well, this is just an open ended question. and It'll be interesting for us to talk. It's not really trivia, but so do you all know the Buttergur species? The um, You have the red crown roof turtle, the northern river terrapin, and the three-striped uh, river turtle. You can pull them up. But the males in the breeding season have insane colors on their heads. So like, how do you all think that those have evolved and like the coloration and like why? And why do you think that the males only in this genus have turned out to be so colorful only in the breeding season? Like... This is like I have a few guesses, but yeah. One well, thing I, I remember. That, oh, go, oh, so go, 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 go on, Jason. 
I was going to say, like, my guess would probably just be, like, as a way to, like, signal to females that they have, like, the extra, um, I guess, like, health and nutrients or whatever. Because, like, certain fish species, like, they'll, like, uh, the, the, they'll get the coloration to show that they are, like, essentially, like, I guess, healthy and, like, strong. And they have, like, the excess, like, energy to make those colors and therefore, like, mm -hmm. would be, like, a good uh, reproductive partner. Um, I also know in, like, some fish uh species as well or at least like one that i heard about in a lecture like look at particularly like red stomachs to show that they like have a mm -hmm. tolerance to like high parasite load so it kind of ties back into like showing that they're like healthy and you know like a better uh you know mate choice than like other um, males yeah. I, was thinking, yeah, go ahead. I was thinking, I was thinking well, pretty much the go same ahead, thing go ahead. So, but also I think a part of it is they live in really large free flowing like river systems with a strong current to where I don't know how effective c communications through pheromones would be at all. Mm -hmm. So maybe it has to be mostly visual. And if it like it, like if we're talking like canostronids or some, something I'm used to seeing over here where they may not always live in a very, they may live in lentic bodies of water or slow moving streams or something that doesn't, that's not particularly turbid and where, it may be a, an effective way of communication, you, but if in those major rivers, if the males are extremely bright, then right when they're interacting with each other, even when it's really turbid, if they're just a couple inches away, the female, they can pick up on that right away. They can see each other's coloration and then that's all they need to know. And they got it from there like that. The, yeah. I think that's I got exactly that. my hypothesis. That's what me and my advisor also think is primarily the reason because like some of the like the red, white, blue and yellow stripes like to have all of those colors on one head of a male like why would only those specific colors and like such a complex color pattern like evolve is another question but like we also think that it's the same thing where it has to be primarily visual. But yeah. Right. That would, it's also interesting that they have different, like your the Nongoka and the Kachuga are sympatric in a lot of places. Yeah. So you might have kind of different patterns arise because you have kind of a different yeah. starting point over time, right? And, and that sort of becomes, yeah. it's interesting too, right? I, I don't know, the males get these sort of expressed colors just in general, but maybe there's also some selection for brighter colors in certain mm -hmm. males. Like that would yeah. be kind of where that, yeah, that sexual selection. You, would when be. you look at like, I've seen sub adults that um, have very, very, like it doesn't look bright. It's very, very faint. And then the yellow stripes haven't shown up, but then you see much bigger males that it's like really, really, really bright. And you can see that they're like healthy, thriving males. So even in the Northern River Terrapin, like the males, like the head is like completely black and then it becomes bright pink. Their uh, forelimbs and the neck becomes like crimson red pink. It's just like fascinating. Yeah. Something yeah. that I, like early on in my master's, I was like, oh, that's something I want to study. But that's like way too complex to even try to figure out like what is the genetic or, you know, evolutionary basis for that. So Right. That's a whole different sort of field yeah. from, from ecology. I know. Uh, I, I there guess is a like, there's a frog um called the moor frog in europe and asia rana mm -hmm. arvalis the males also become blue for courtship oh. mm -hmm. but only only under direct sunlight so mm -hmm. i think mm -hmm. if we, we, we could see if that's the case for uh, for badiger if, yeah. if the males only have those orange heads in direct sunlight that could mm -hmm. uh, that could really i guess suggest that they rely primarily on visual contact mm -hmm. to yeah. um display courtship right because yeah. you know if they didn't they don't need to change colors if if the, the female can't even see them yeah also like the pigments where like where are they getting the pigments from right All right it's so interesting yeah yeah that's that's a pretty interesting cellular thing to to look at there yeah. uh all right i don't know if you've got any more questions but i, I have a few but if you guys have some for me then go ahead i'll try my best Okay, I mean, we, yeah, we can. I don't know about time, though, but if you've got a few more minutes. Yeah, I maybe mean, like 10, yeah, 10 more minutes. Okay, we, okay, so we're good. I mean, we, we could do a few questions if you, if you want to do that. Yeah. I, I've got one on the top of my head if everyone else has one or wants to think I kinda, about it. I kind of got one. Yeah. Okay, I've, I've got yeah, one. Got I can one. start us off. So in the Galapagos, there's multiple varieties of tortoises. Um, what What is one variety that, that's considered 
most closely or kind of second most closely related to the Hood Island tortoise? I have no idea. Is it the the Ferdinand Island one? I don't know. Is that even remotely a correct guess? The I was thinking the Pinta Island tortoise. Oh, is okay. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily no. kind of make it makes sense morphology wise. They're both kind of like, saddle backed, but oh yeah, they exactly. also it, the way yeah, the current like, worked. Yeah. No, the I have no thing. idea about that. Like. If it's easy to look at the Galapagos tortoises and uh, try and associate them, associate them with each other based simply on how close they are because of the yeah. islands, but that's not really the main factor of their distribution. It was how the currents have carried them. That's mm -hmm. like because Pinta and Española, like those two islands, are on opposite ends of the archipelago. Mm -hmm. Yet the close, the tor those two species are really closely related, more so than the ones. I mean, Española is surrounded by several other islands, and those yeah. aren't the closest relatives to it. So. I always found that interesting. Interesting, yeah. All right, that was kind of an obscure one. Jack, you've got one. Uh, yeah, it's actually about the geoclemmies. Like, mm -hmm. I noticed that they feed. They're they're reported to feed like on snails mostly, and they yeah. kind of have a, a a bigger head, yeah. A, like a larger, more built skull, but yeah. it doesn't seem to become exaggeratedly like hypertrophied, like you see in. Uh, musk turtles or yeah. in snail eating turtles or anything like that it just seems to be kind of static and that they're always yeah. the same size but it still seems powerfully built like have you seen yeah. skulls of ones or like i have plates seen... inside their no i have I, I don't think anyone's even done any of that work in india and i uh, i haven't seen a skull of that but i i have read from literature that they're supposed to be specialized for eating mollusks and Definitely, I guess when you look at their heads and their jaws, you can see that they, I think it also comes down to probably um, their bite force or their jaw force that they have is probably stronger than a lot of the other. And also the their gape, would, it seems to be much, much bigger than um, other species that are of the same size. So that's probably a, a specialized. I can see that it would be specialized for malas, but... Again, there hasn't been any any recent research on it, and I'm I'm not even sure how the initial reports on on the mollusk um, behavior even have come. Probably there was a bunch of researchers very early on who did do dissections and um, you know check stomach contents, and probably that's how they or also visually observed turtles eating mollusks, but. As far as I know, I haven't found anything on like very detailed, like to show that their skeletal or their skull um, and their jaw plates are specialized for eating mollusks. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I don't know if anyone's got, we can get one more, one or two more here. Uh, yeah. So how large and then fry an hill or I get? I have no idea what that even is. What's, what's the common name? Say that again. Uh, Phrynops hillari. It's like a big, like South American turtle. It's got like two barbells under its chin and like black and white sort of coloration to it. Mm. No idea. If someone else knows. Seventeen inches uh, or like forty-four mm -hmm. centimeters. So they get pretty big. Big, yeah. How how big did the mata matas get? Don't they get bigger than that? Yes, actually, they they can get a lot bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we'll probably talk a lot about them in some future episodes. But yeah, we've got some stuff I mean, planned for that. <laughs> there's if you look up online, or there's no this one guy. This guy's on Facebook. This keeper at the Bronx. This he has a former keeper at the Bronx who is, who's has a lot of knowledge on turtle keeping and has been around for decades. Uh, his name's Frank Indiviglio, I think, and he has okay. lots of little anecdotal records like that. And there's a picture of him where he, I, I asked him about it. He said he, this was at a, they rescued this one in a market somewhere in like Brazil, I think. Okay. And it was easily 60 centimeters in carapace length. Like it was giant. Like he's holding it up like this and it's like the size of a, a small female Macrochelys. Like it's actually giant. Giant, yeah. They weigh up almost, almost 40, 50 pounds they can get. It's, they get pretty big. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure in the Amazon the, they could get bigger. Yeah, for sure. They go undetected easily. <laughs> yeah. 
There's a little book about them that has some size reports. I don't recall what the biggest was, but it, it seemed to kind of conclude that a lot of the measurements could be variable based on where people actually measure it. So some reports are probably not in that accurate, but th yeah, they get easily 20, 25 plus inches. Or, so um, yeah, I think that if anyone else has got one, maybe Ken's got one, we can finish it off. Um, okay. Hopefully this hasn't changed, but if we're, okay, if we're looking at like a phylogeny of the Kitra genus, uh, which, which species is the basal group? Oh, interesting. But there, there's one in China. Um, I, I wouldn't know because honestly, from photos that I've seen, they all kind of look pretty similar. Like even the Java, probably would the Java one be older? I'm not sure. I, would, um, I wouldn't know. Has this work been done? Uh, I'm looking at a 2002 paper, so Is I'm it not by Peter sure Shab? if it's changed, but it looks like it's in Dica. Oh, really? And oh, Yeah. And, yeah. Is that the one by Peter Pritchard and Bill McCord? Oh. Um, it, I think Peter Prashag did this work and Gimel. Did he? Yeah, yeah, he he's the one that proposed that him and I think McCord proposed the Havanensis and Van Dyke, and then Havanensis was synonymized at yeah. some point after. But that's interesting. It, that's it's interesting, cool. yeah. Well, I mean, so even um, the monotypic genuses that uh, the genera that we have in India, the Geoclemus, Hardella, um, what else do we have? Vijaya Kellis. So especially the Geoclemus and Hardella, uh, like I went to like an obscure museum, um, geological museum in North India, and there were like fossil specimens of Geoclemus and Hardella that were like different species, like from centuries and centuries ago uh, but looked the shells and everything looked remarkably the same as the current species so i do know that these monotypic are probably like they're the last remaining of their genera right now but it's interesting to see how how far back they go specifically in the indus ganges you know delta and it, I mean, yeah, there's so much work to be done on fossils as well that hasn't been done in India. And I'm sure that the entire Indus, Indus Belta is is like they, they've been finding a lot of fossils. So I'm sure that like there's a lot more to be uncovered about turtles as well. Turtle fossils. I think that's a great place to end it, finish it off for today. I think that's good. There's a lot more to learn. Uh, I think that's that's seems to be always the case with turtles it's like yeah. that when you really answer a question you figure out there's so many more questions to to be yeah. answered um but yeah so in speaking of fossils we've got some cool fossil episodes coming up on the horizon yeah. here um but yeah so thank you so much for coming on the the podcast today so um, thank you. yeah we've really we've really enjoyed it um and where uh, can we to say in terms that, yeah? Do you run the FTT India, uh, what is it, like, Instagram page? So, uh, we've actually, I feel like most of you have been talking to our intern, Jyotsna. She's amazing. She's also, like like y'all, she just finished her undergrad and just is so passionate and is trying to learn so much, like, way advanced than what I was at her age. Um, but no, it's it's mostly been in her that has been like conversing with you guys probably in the DMs. But we do we do oversee it. We do have some interns that that mainly run it. Uh, but I do I'm the main person who oversees it. Yeah. Cool. And I guess that leads it. Where where can we find? Where can listeners find you on? Oh, so my personal is Anuja Mittal, uh, just my name. But then y'all can also follow FTTF India on Instagram and Facebook. And um, check out our um, India Biodiversity Portal page, uh, FTTI, where uh, we have all of the species pages. So it's kind of like a digital field guide that's updated and peer-reviewed. 
Um, so you can click on the species pages and go through each each species, find all the information that's available on it, like really briefly, uh, just a synopsis on each thing, and then also check out the occurrence records across India that we have for them. So it's a, it's a really cool tool to have, and it's you can check it out on on your phones too. It's it 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 translates pretty easily onto your mobile phone as well. We also have uh, an FTTI group on iNaturalist as well, if you want to check that out. Um, I don't do a very good job of moderate, like, because a lot of a lot of white people give really, really wrong IDs on iNaturalist for Indian species. So as soon as I go, I, I get so mad and then I spend two hours correcting all of it. And then it's such a waste of my time that I feel like, oh no, I was just like, what am I doing? Um, so I've I've kind of been lax on it, but we do have a group on iNaturalist if you want to check that out. And if you'll ever do visit India, um, do let me know. I'd be happy to show you guys around if I'm there. For sure. We'll, we'll definitely take you up on that one. <laughs> hopefully when we're there at some point. Uh, but thanks for coming on. Yeah. Thanks for yeah. having me. All yeah, the best of this. I'm really looking forward to some of, especially the fossil episodes. I would de I definitely watch that. Yes, there's some cool. We got some cool stuff planned. So uh, for all our listeners out there, please stay tuned for some cool stuff. Uh, and this was a, a great show, but you can find us again at the turtleroom.org slash Colonia cast. Uh, thank you for tuning in today. All right. See you, everyone. Bye.